So we will continue with this section where we find Sri Ramakrishna is visiting Vidyasagar and the conversation is going on between them. In the last class, we ended with the section where Sri Ramakrishna was discussing that Brahman and Shakti are identical. So Brahman alone is addressed as the mother this is because a mother is an object of great love. One is able to realize God just through love, ecstasy of feeling, devotion, love and faith. These are the means. Listen to a song. So what uh, we actually, what is the concept? That's not important. The feeling is more important. The concept of the divinity, sometimes we fight with that. We say my concept is more refined than yours. But Sri Ramakrishna is here stressing the need for the feeling, the devotion, whatever the concept we may believe in, that is immaterial. The more the feeling, the more the devotion, the more there is a chance of spiritual evolution. So the song which he sang, actually indicates that as is a man's meditation so is his feeling of love as is a man's feeling of love so is his gain and faith is the root of all if in the nectar lake of mother Kali's feet my mind remains immersed of little use or worship oblations or sacrifice so so here his in this song, the thing which is stressing is the feeling, the feeling of love, the devotion that is more important. In spiritual life, we generally think that it is our willpower which entails the progress in our spiritual evolution. Yes, at the beginning, the willpower do play an important role. That with the willpower, once what I have understood to be asat, that which is not permanent, that which is flowing, that which is not going to stay for through eternity, that I have to, through discrimination, renounce. And that gives us a feeling of the need for the willpower. Yes, at the beginning, we do need a willpower. But that will has to get converted into devotion. Till the devotion dawns in us, there can never be the real meditation. Without devotion, just by will, there can never be any real meditation. Whether I am a jnani or whether I am a bhakta, whatever I may be, the real spiritual progress happens only with devotion. So this is the idea that the will, that as a human being, we will find that we have that faculty to guide our emotions with will. No other creature has that. And that's the unique capacity to guide our emotions with will, which speaks of spiritual evolution, not only spiritual evolution, even in our day-to-day -day life. If we have to have our life very integrated. We have to guide our emotions with our will in every field of life. A doctor 
before starting his profession. He's passionate about it or she's passionate about it. But first, he or she has to guide his entire profession by the Hippocratic youth, this oath. All the doctors have to go through that. Any politician passionate about ruling over the country has to take some oath. A player, the Olympic players, have to take the oath first. In the marriage, first comes the oath, first comes the vow, and then you start your life. Your passions, your emotions have to be guided by that oath. And that's why we find that there is a huge celebration whenever there is an oath taking. Because if you take a vow for which there is no witness, that vow has no meaning. So there should be a lot of witness. And to invite people to witness what oath you are taking, you have to have a celebration. There should be some feeding and all. Otherwise, why should people come? So now you will find that all the celebrations, wherever the oath taking is involved, you have to have a huge gathering. People come in the presence of others. You take your vows. And now you, what I am to do the rest of the life, I have to guide my emotions with that vows which I have taken. A marriage is successful as long as we can guide our emotions with the will in all the fields of life, that if you have to have your life integrated, you have to guide your emotions with your will. And that's the same thing in spiritual life. At the beginning, that willpower do play a great role. But gradually, that willpower that uh, has to uh, go away and it has to be replaced by that devotion and love. But in the olden days when there was an, where there used to be an arranged marriage, the bride and the groom never knew each other. At the marriage ceremony, it was just the will, nothing else. And when they start the life, the will was replaced by love gradually. They kept their, what you say, these this emotions always guided by the will. Renunciation is required everywhere. It's not only the monk even a householder, constantly they are lured by so many things. It's natural. The human has the, the tendency. But as long as the capacity to guide my emotions with the will, that what, which all emotions are acceptable, which are not, if I can guide them, it's very obvious my life will be integrated. Otherwise, it will be shattered. That we cannot break the laws. We can just in the attempt to break the laws, we will be breaking ourselves. So these are the common basic rules that the more as a human being, this with, we use this unique faculty to guide our emotions with our will, the more integrated our life is. The same thing is in the spiritual life. It starts with the will that I will have to meditate, think of God, get rid of the distraction. And this thing, as, as, as I go on practicing, for that, I may take the help of rituals, oblations, sacrifice. All these are actually meant to discipline my mind. But once the mind is disciplined and the emotion starts welling up in the form of devotion, then the willpower is no more required. This love itself will start guiding our progress in spiritual life. And the more the devotion, the more qualitative is our meditation. To give a common example, does a mother ever meditate on the child lest she forgets her child? When the love is there, whatever she is doing, the, the remembrance of the child is always there. Whatever household activity she is doing, she is doing the thought of the child is always there in the background of her mind. She can never forget. And isn't it the best form of meditation? It's the best form of meditation. For that, there is no need for any willpower that I have to sit down and think of my child lest I forget. There's no need. The love makes the meditation spontaneous. That's what Sri Ramakrishna is to say. Let the love for God become our toothache. When we have a toothache, then we can never forget that. Whatever we may be doing, 
It's the, the ache is always there behind all the activities. I can never forget it. So when I have developed that love for God, it is always there in the background of your mind. You can never forget about that, about that thought of the divine. And that results in what? A spontaneous meditation, a spontaneous flow. So that's why as is a man's meditation, so is his feeling of love. Whatever may be the concept, if you develop love, that entails in a flow. Your mind gets more and more absorbed in it. And that alone can take you to the realization by the dissolution of the ego. That flow at last dissolves the ego. You get so intensely immersed in their object of meditation that everything else falls off at last even to take away your ego. The last remnant with which the mind holds on to this worldly plane of existence is the ego. That also falls off and you get merged in the object of meditation, whatever it may be. And that leads to the realization. The moment the ego falls off, immediately the amnes becomes non-local, which all the mystics of all the religions have experienced. And from where, where you come back, you're a total transformed person. So that's the idea behind this song. As is a man's meditation, so his feeling of love. As is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain. The more that devotion, the more is again. And faith is the root of all. As we were discussing even in the previous class, the faith is a very important thing. With all intellectual rationalization, at last, I will have to start from that square zero, the practice. All those understanding won't help me. At last, I will turn out to be a learned fool, that intellectual fool. That's uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna asked Naren one day that what he was discussing. And that's the thing that when you, when you read, when the, your uh, study of the philosophy is over, you turn to be a learned fool. And then the man earns for spirituality. So that we become a learned fool. Or what? That we realize that with all this understanding, that it is the practice that can take me to that realization. Before that, it is just noise. All the scriptures with all the concepts is mere noise. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a wonderful example that when from a distant, you hear the noise in the market, it is just a mere noise. From a distant, it is just a mere noise. When you go near, when you are in the market, you find that actually they're all uh, bargaining, they're all shouting out the price, all those you can hear distinctly. But when you were at a distance, it was a noise. So he says that unless you have realized, realization means going to the market. Scripture is like just hearing to that noise from a distance. It makes no sense. So you have to realize. And that is possible only through faith, that faith begets that love, from that love comes that intense meditation resulting in the dissolution of the ego to take you to that domain of realization. So if in the nectar lake of Mother Kali's feet, my mind remains immersed. So the one who is the author of this song is the devotee of Kali, the Sadhak Ram Prashad. So that's why he's saying that if my mind is always absorbed in the feet of in the lotus feet of Mother Kali, then what's the use of worship, oblations, or sacrifice? They are just meant for that. The worship, oblations, and sacrifice, they're all meant to regiment my mind, to discipline my mind. It's just reducing the bandwidth. When at the very beginning, my mind is so disturbed. If I try to just hold on to the name and just remain absorbed, it is impossible because my mind is always in a disturbed state. So what I have to do, I have to reduce the bandwidth, first narrow it, streamline it. So what I do, I have this paraphernalia of worship. Lot of activities are there, stotras are there, chants are there. So the mind do get the chance to jump from one thought to another. 
because there are variety of activities. But still, though it has the scope to traverse from one thought to another, one activity to another, but still it is limited within all the things which has been prescribed for the worship. It cannot distract to some baser thoughts. So that entails to certain ancient of purity, chitta shuddhi. That when I am just sitting idle, the mind can go down to any level. But when you are worshipping, when you are having oblation, sacrifice, that doesn't actually result in real concentration, the focus of the mind. But all those activities actually is keeping your mind in a narrower bandwidth. It doesn't allow you to distract to some baser things. So that way gradually you are reducing. I cannot in a days just hold onto the name, hold onto the name of the Lord and get immersed in it. It's not possible. Gradually. So that's why worship, oblation, sacrifice, they do have a role in disciplining the mind. But once that love has developed, they all fall off. So now Sri Ramakrishna, uh, after singing this song, is again uh, conversing. What he's saying, what is needed is absorption in God, loving him intensely. The nectar lake is the lake of immortality. A man sinking in it does not die, but becomes immortal. Some people believe that by thinking of God too much, the mind becomes deranged. But that is not true. So that's, there was a Brahmo devotee, Shibnath Shastri, who used to say that Ramakrishna has deranged his mind by thinking too much of God. So here, though he's not taking his name, was probably that Shibnath Shastri is the one who is in his thought because Ramakrishna himself have heard Shibnath saying that, that if you think too much of God, you derange your mind. And Ramakrishna used to say, very interesting in his in, in response to it, he used to say that can anyone become unconscious by thinking, thinking of the conscious principle? The one who is the ultimate conscious principle, by thinking of him, can anyone become unconscious? But now many may doubt, but isn't it true? We do see there are so many cases that uh, someone who resorted to spiritual life have become mentally deranged. There are many cases. Even Swami Vivekananda much later used to say that spiritual life is not easy. That if 100 per, uh, this 100 persons are involved, means if people, uh, the, the total number of people who are seeking to lead a spiritual life, who have taken a resolution to lead a spiritual life. He used to say that of them, know it for certain, 80% are hypocrites, humbugs. They want to show, make a show of religion. They really don't want to lead the life. That's why Swami Vivekananda used to say a very interesting thing, that the energy which we spent in throughout our life to make others feel to show to others that how nice person I am, what a good man I am. If I have used that much of energy to really transform myself, I would have been a totally transformed being. So much energy we waste just to make ourselves that, what you say, that have a good impression, have a good profile, that people should say I am holy. And all our intentions, knowingly, unknowingly, is towards that. We waste so much of energy in that to make ourselves look holy, look good. If we would have really tried, we would have been most probably a transformed person. So 80% we would find to certain extents, there's a humbugism. There's, they're humbugs, hypocrites. It's a fact of life. Spirituality is not that easy. 80% gone. Another 15%, Swami Vivekananda is saying, gets mentally deranged to a certain extent another 15%. And uh, the remaining 5% somehow proceeds towards the goal. And of them, how many will go to relation, we don't know. So this is what Swamiji is saying. And when Ramakrishna is saying that thinking of God, does anyone become mad? So now let us try to understand when we really are thinking of God, it can never lead us to any sort of madness. What happens? 
that being frustrated with the struggle of life. We were highly ambitious about our this worldly uh, this ambitions. We were highly ambitious about the worldly way of life. And in no time, we get frustrated. We find that all the dreams which we had starts falling off. You know that previously in all the professional courses, there was the ragging. But there, uh, nowadays it is totally banned. But there was a philosophy behind the ragging. We, you know, people don't know that why that ragging was there. The philosophy is something wonderful that anyone who enters a professional course in the first year, his feet as if doesn't fall on the ground. He thinks he has conquered the world. The world is now at his feet. Everything will be as he want once he gets that degree. Those who are senior, the second year, third year, they have already been exposed to the professional life. They have got an idea what's waiting for them. And it's not that, that, that uh, the dream which they were having. They know there will be situations in the workplace where, where with all your skills, with all your qualities, with all your capabilities, you will find there is politics, there is bossing. And you find that your, that you thought with all your intellect, with all your skills, the, uh, the path is unhindered. And you find there are so many hindrances for which you don't find any reason. If the boss is bossing over you irrationally, you go and challenge him, next day your work is not there. So the ragging was there to make you aware of that. That I will come and unnecessarily harass you. You react, I will harass you more. Why? To know that in this life there will be situations where you cannot change the circumstance. You have only to bend your attitude. And for that, it needs a type of training. It's, uh, you, it's not reflected in your certificate. It's not your, uh, there's, what is this, a hard certificate which you have. It's all the soft skills they speak of that you have to develop. So now we find for most of us, we start with so much of optimism. At last, a short of pessimism starts dawning in your life as if all the paths which we thought is just broad open for me. Suddenly I find it's, it has no more there. It, has, it is just there is a, uh, a dead end. You have reached the dead end of a maze. You cannot proceed anymore. And then we think of some other way of life which may give me happiness. It's not the real devotion for God. Yes, God becomes our way of escape. And now it's not that easy. I may think, oh, let, let me leave all this and I will try to live a very spiritual life. But I actually have no love for it. It's just a way of escapism. And then I try to force myself to in that way of life. What happens? I see that there are people who are quite adept in spiritual life. They can meditate for hours, spend life, uh, spend their day without thinking of any worldly thought. And I try to imitate them, thinking that that is the way out from this situation. And what happens in that case? It's just like a person who thinks of going to the gym to build up his body and see someone just lifting, the, lifting a very heavy weight and he looks quite muscular or maybe just flinching his muscles by, uh, with a dumbbell. He's, dumb, he's using the dumbbell to flinch his muscles and he's doing it 50 times, 60 times. He thinks, wow, let me just imitate him. What will happen? In a very short time, he will develop cramp and that he will be harming himself. He has to go gradually. In a, just in a single day, he cannot just simply imitate the one who has really developed that strength. So the way he will be harming himself, even in the so-called the one who getting frustrated with the worldly life, thinks of leading a spiritual life and in the process thinks of imitating someone. Yes, there is a chance of derangement. 
because there is no real absorption in the God. So you will find that what Sri Ramakrishna is saying, if one is absorbed in the divine, has developed that love, there is no question of derangement. Where the derangement has happened is just because of imitation. That's why Swami Vivekananda again and again warned the sadhus, the novices who is, to, who is to join the order, being inspired by Swami Vivekananda. Again and again he's saying, don't imitate. That's the thing, that don't imitate. So when Sri Ramakrishna is saying that when you are absorbed in God, there is no chance of getting mad. St still holds good. Because they, in that case, what has happened, there is no real love for God. It is just forcing yourself to something which you are yet to develop the devotion, the capability to remain absorbed. So here, what is it? another reason, maybe this other is that, that here also we find that it is actually not real love for spiritual life. It is the attempt to avoid the responsibilities, which is resulting in derangement. And I cannot avoid them because my mind is not prepared for it. My mind has its own vagaries. And now I find that previously all those engagements kept my mind busy with that. Now, when I simply leave that work, without developing the faculty to really remain absorbed in the divine. I don't know what to do with the vagaries of mind. Because previously the mind was engaged in something. My responsibilities kept me engaged. Now it is free. And that can again, and now if I force, try to get rid of the vagaries by force to make a show of spirituality, that can be madness. So real, the one who has developed that flow, it can never result in madness. But yes, it may look like madness. In the life of Sri Ramakrishna, we find that when he was so intensely absorbed in the thought of the divine, he had that viraha, that with all my spiritual absorption, I don't have that realization, the vision of the divine, that created that sense of separation. With that, he had that tremendous pangs of pains of separation he used to rub his face on the ground. People used to think that he has gone mad. And when people used to say that uh, he has gone mad, in his reply, his, his reply, Ramakrishna's responses were unique. He used to say, he never denied that he's, that he's mad. He, too, he accepted, yes, I am mad. I am mad for God. And then he added, just please let me know who is not mad. By default, all are mad. And he used to say, some are mad after money, some are mad after woman, some are mad after name and fame. I am mad after God. That's the only difference. So just see that simple this word when he's saying that real love for God can never result in the derangement of the mind. So to understand that, we have to understand in the proper context. That if we really have love for God, there cannot be madness. And if it appears as madness, it is just because I have not developed love for God. And the one who has developed love for God, he's a minority. It is a minority. In this world, there is nothing called absolute truth. It is all the question of the vote of the majority. That what the majority votes, that is the law, that is the truth. So here, we all are mad after name, fame, uh, this power, position, sex, and all those things. So the one we find is mad after something else, we say he's mad. So that's how we have to relate to these words. What is needed is absorption in God, loving him intensely. The nectar lake is the lake of immortality. A man sinking in it does not die, but becomes immortal. Some people believe that by thinking of God too much, the mind becomes deranged, but that is not true. God is the lake of nectar, the ocean of immortality. He's called the immortal in the Vedas. Sinking in it, one does not die, but verily transcends death. In some other place, there is a very nice conversation between Ramakrishna and Narendra Nath. That one day, uh, Ramakrishna asks Narendra that suppose there is a lake of nectar and you have become a fly. What will you do? 
So Narendra told, I will sit in the shore and sip the nectar. Otherwise, I will get drowned. And then Ramakrishna told, you are forgetting. It is the ocean of immortality. If they're there, the moment, uh, there is no question of dying there. Sinking and dying. You cannot sink and die because it's the ocean of immortality. The moment you get immersed, you become immortal. So don't think of sitting on the shore and enjoying. It means to a certain extent, I keep my worldly engagements intact and just as, as a, a way to spend my leisure, I have some spirituality. That way you can never progress in spiritual life. Spirituality can never be a part-time affair. As, as Swami Vivekananda, in the same words of Ramakrishna, much later used to say, that for most of us, spirituality is just a matter of hobby or just a choice. He used to, say, he used to give a very nice example. Suppose a fashionable lady has the choice to collect a lot of antiques. Among various antiques from the East and West, he also had in the corner of his house a Feng Shui or a Laughing Buddha. You have seen many that Feng Shui. So this Feng Shui is one among the many. For most of us, spirituality is like a just a matter of choice, a hobby. I am engaged with so many things. Spirit, also, there is a flavor of spirituality. That way we can never progress in spiritual life. So you have to get totally immersed in it. Then only the spiritual evolution is possible. Sinking in it, one does not die, but verily transcends in death. The more one gets absorbed in it, the more he gets spiritually evolved. Of little use or worship, oblations or sacrifice. So those things are just like the fence. At the beginning of spiritual life, they act like a fence because the sapling of my spirituality is something very uh, vulnerable. It is not yet strong. So fence is required. Once the sapling has become a tree, there's no need for the fence. So that's why Swami Vivekananda used to say that it is good to be born in a church, but it is horrible to die there. By church, he doesn't mean just the Christian church. By church, he means any sort of formal religion, formal uh, denominations. It is good to be born in that. That helps us to discipline ourselves. But it is horrible to die there if we have not outgrown that. We have just remained a spiritual sapling. If there is still the need of the fence, even after years, it speaks that the sapling has not grown. It is still vulnerable. So the worship, oblation, sacrifice, they are of little use, secondary use. At the beginning, they do have some use, but we have to outgrow them to have real, that intense devotion. If a man comes to love God, he need not trouble himself much about these activities. One needs a fan and Ramakrishna, the master, for example, what a nice example he's giving now. One needs a fan only as long as there is no breeze. The fan may be laid aside if the southern breeze blows. Then what is there in need of a fan? So in a hot, sultry day, we use the hand fan to cool ourselves. And suddenly the southern breeze starts blowing. Then what's the need of that fan? So all the worship, oblations, and sacrifice are like that hand fan on the sultry, dry, sultry weather. The dry, sultry weather speaks of the dry heart in which the devotion is yet to sprout the dry heart. So then that fan is required. And when that devotion, the southern breeze is the devotion that has started flowing, that has started flowing in your heart, then there's no need for that all those rituals, worship and sacrifice. They fall off. That's what in Bhakti Shastra they speak of. There are two types of Bhakti. Vaidhi Bhakti and Para Bhakti. Vaidhi, at the beginning, you have to have uh, this uh, fixed amount of uh, uh, repeating the name of the Lord. Do every day, I will have to do 10,000 japa or uh, this uh, perform the rituals, have uh, these marks, various marks, have counting of the beads. So many things are there. Take uh, holy deep in the Ganges. All this speaks of Vaidhi Bhakti. Once that love has developed, that speaks of the Para Bhakti. The Vaidhi Bhakti leads to the Para Bhakti. So once that is there, the Para Bhakti have developed that supreme love. 
then all this vaidhi bhakti is of no use. Then the fire automatically falls off. To vidya sadhana, the activities that you are engaged in are good. It is very good if you can perform them in a selfless spirit, renouncing egotism, giving up the idea that you are the doer. Through such action, one develops love and devotion to God and ultimately realizes Him. After speaking of bhakti, now as if you know the life of Vidya Sagar, he was an extremely scholarly person, but Vidya Sagar means the ocean of knowledge, Vidya Sagar. But he had a very kind heart. Whoever used to approach him for any type of pecuniary help, he will never uh, let him go with empty hands. He was an extremely kind-hearted person. And that's why that though academically he got that title Vidya Sagar, people started calling him as Daya Sagar, that he was an ocean of kindness. So with so much of this pecuniary help and philanthropic activities, it was magnanimous amount of work he was doing. So that's why when Sri Ramakrishna is saying that all the activities you are engaged in are good. It is very good if you can perform them in a selfless spirit. The philanthropic itself by itself doesn't really uh, uh, yield the fulfillment in life. You will find those who are philanthropists, after some time, they get totally discouraged, disheartened. You will find that in so many ways, the politics, the people's wrong understanding come in the way and you get disheartened. If the mere doing good to the world is your aim, in the words of Ramakrishna in some other place, he has told, the world is a dog's curly tail. However you try to straighten it, it never gets straightened. But we should try, we should go on our try, we, we should go on trying to straighten it. Why? If it, does, it cannot be straightened, why should I try to straighten it? That in the process of our attempt to straighten it, it won't get straightened, but we will get straightened. There's this nice story which Sri Ramakrishna used to say that a man was in search of a ghost who will do all the odd works for him. He will take his orders and just do whatever he wants. So he went to a Pishat Siddha, a person who can deliver such ghost. The man told, yes, I can. I do can uh, deliver you such a ghost who will just work for you as a servant. But there, be cautious. There's a warning. It is extremely active. It cannot stay without act, any type of uh, work. If you just allow it to be idle even for a moment, so it will come and break your neck. So it will destroy you. So you have to give him work continuously. You know, that's easy. There's so much, so much thing to do. And the ghost was delivered to that person. And now, the, when the ghost asked for the, the, he asked for the order, he told, yes, clean the house, uh, fetch water, and everything he's doing just in a moment. The man was really now very much uh, thrilled. He told, oh, I can get, uh, uh, I can do such a lot of things uh, uh, just by ordering him. He went to a forest where no one was, there was no habitation. He told, clean up the jungle. He came just within five minutes, done. Build a palace, done. Now that whatever he's saying in moment that let me have a nice city all around the palace, done. And then he started fumbling. What to ask, whatever I say, he does it in a moment. And now he found that he's approaching him. The moment he was just about to, he was taking some time to decide what to ask him. The ghost was approaching him to break his neck. The man was terrified. He started running. He was running to the person who has delivered him that ghost to save himself. When he reached him and told his plight, he told, I have previously warned you. Then, I, then he told, I never realized that he will do so instantly whatever I ask him. And now I have nothing to uh, ask him to deliver. 
please save me. And then that man told, okay, you just see a dog lying there. You go and cut the tail of the dog. You just take his sword and cut it and give it to the ghost and ask him to straighten. So that's what he did. He went and cut the tail and gave it to the ghost. Now the ghost tried to straighten it. The moment it released it, it again got coiled. The ghost went on trying and that he could never straighten the, the tail of the dog. It again coiled back. So now the ghost got exhausted. It came and told the man that I won't, I, I, he just said, I'm not going to harm you. Just release me. Enough. That release me, I won't harm you. So this is the story. What's the idea? That the world is the dog's curly tail. We, like the ghost, are trying to straighten it. It never gets straightened. At last, what happens? We have to say, oh, release me. It is I. At last, it is you who has to be released. It is you who gets straightened at last. So what's the idea that's behind this? If, you're, if your ideal is just philanthropic activities, know it for certain, the world will never have any solution, permanent solution. You just see the way the world for thousands of years, so many, per, so many uh, person inspired in all fields, whether it is religion, whether it is politics, whether it is science, have thought of bringing change to the world. Have the really world, have the world changed? You find what has happened in the words of Swami Vivekananda, the world is like a rheumatic patient. For a rheumatic patient, if he has a pain in the elbow, you massage there, the pain just shifts. It may go to the shoulder, but it never vanishes. It's there. It changes the form. As chokingly that they say that with all the high ideals of socialism, communism, what has happened? Only the roles have changed. Previously, the landlord was sitting on the top of the horse and he was whipping the slave who was standing on the ground. So he was sitting on the top of the horse with a whip in his hand. He was whipping the slave. After the revolution, only the role have changed. The slave is now on the top of the horse and that landlord is standing on the ground and it is he who is whipping. The whipping is still going on. It is only the roles have changed. Can you deny it? I have heard very, I, I came from a state in West Bengal, which was ruled by the communists. So all those uh, discussions were used to go on. What very nice thing I have heard there once that when the, uh, you know, that with the communist, communist movement and all the, there, there was a very common uh, uh, proverb that religion is the opium of the masses. And when with all the lofty ideals, the communist ideals are lofty, but somehow we human have the unique capacity to bring down any ideal, compromise to such an extent that it starts to produce all evil results. Everywhere you will find that how it has actually been compromised. So now, uh, just to counteract that Marx statement that uh, religion is the opium of the masses, they have started saying that so-called communism and socialism is the opium of the intellectuals. A few intellectuals think of those dream ideas. And very interesting, in the book called The Encyclopedia of Religions, the one, the, the movement, the social movement, which was decrying religion, was trying to get rid of religion in Russia for 60 years, any type of formal religion was banned. That the socialism, that communism, he has entered into the book of religion as a religion. They say that it is also, so just what I'm trying to say, it is not in a way to uh, just criticize anything. In this world, anything you take, you know, now already we have started saying that the climate change is going on. The world has to be green again. Already there are many such countries where they have to certain extent been successful in making the world greener, more vegetation. With that, the old things which we forgot. Previously, there was uh, the, you know, that all the infections used to come through the mosquitoes. The, that's all this malaria and all. It's not the virus. It's the microbes which were transmitted 
uh, this a part of the life cycle was in the mosquito the mosquito bites the human and it is transmitted in the human and that's how the cycle is completed and that's how the disease used to spread in the form of a pandemic and it is coming back the mosquitoes are coming back all those things with the greenery it's coming back now again they have to think that how to get rid of all those swamps where the mosquitoes now if you want to make the world green again you just see it is just changing that like the rheumatic patient you can never get rid of the so called all the problems of life that we they think that by reformation a day will come there won't be any evil all good it's never going to happen so keeping this idea in mind now let us read these activities the activities which are engaged in are good it is very good if you can perform with a selfless spirit not that i am really going to bring change i am bringing a transformation to the world i have to do something immediately the evil which is there i have to get rid of it but that doesn't entail that it has gone forever it will find expression in some other way but in the process i have to develop the idea that world is not the final destination it has been dev devised in such a way that you can never get satisfaction here if i would have got satisfaction here why should i try for spirituality there was no need as the sankhya yoga starts with that idea that if i would have uh, got the ripened mango in the plains why would i climb the hill means there are some mango trees on the top of the hill the plain has no mango tree the climate doesn't allow the mango tree to grow on the plains in some place it is on the top of the hill or not mango any ripe fruit so if i had it on the plains why should i climb so all this sadhana spiritual practice is just because this world can never give you satisfaction you can never get those ripe and fruit in this plane so that's why you have to climb the spirituality speaks of that that after getting disgusted with the material way of living that this is not the goal all my activities philanthropy is not to bring change to the world through doing them with the sense of being instrument in the hand of the divine that if a poor man is there by giving money i cannot make him rich but one thing i realize seeing the poor man a compassion is welling in my heart now that compassion have i developed no seeing a poor man i gave that compassion which i have not developed it just wells up this speaks of the yagya saha yagya praja shrishtva in bhagavad gita that word yagya means this interaction this world is interdependence this interdependence speaks of love compassion god has created his uh, creature with love with compassion so that they take care of each other and it results in a synergy a win win situation so the love that wells up is something which is implanted by the divine in my heart and <clears throat> being an instrument in the hand of the divine there is no other way than to relate to the creation <clears throat> through compassion through love through devotion and that speaks of being instrument in the hand of the divine and that results in renouncing of the egoism when the mother loves the child loves the child it is mother should have the feeling it is not me who is loving <clears throat> god has implanted that love in my heart i am helpless i cannot just stop loving the child it has to be it is something which is implanted in my heart so being the instrument in the hand of the divine if i renounce the egotism that it is i who am loving then the question of suffering doesn't come in any way giving and then that's how you can give up the egoism give up the idea that you are the doer you are just the instrument in the divine plan you are just an instrument with that if you are doing the work not really to bring change to the world then that becomes karma yoga so what actions you are doing is good but the orientation should be proper so now you will understand now vidya sagar was a very very secular person he was not interested in the spiritual way of living though he was daya sagar ramakrishna knew very well that he has uh, <clears throat> no interest in relating to the spiritual dimension of our existence so how nicely 
politely, softly, he is giving, trying to give him that orientation. That maybe you don't have that any orientation for bhakti, but already as per your temperament, you are an active person. You are doing so much of philanthropic activities. You are helping people. Why not just, it's, it's easy for you to uh, just uh, orient yourself in karma yoga. So instead of just thinking that I will help the people, do it with the sense of that selfless spirit by renouncing egoism, giving up the idea that you are the doer. Through such action, one develops love and devotion to God. Because constantly, whatever you are doing, you are thinking that it is not me who I am doing. It is the Lord who is doing through me. And I have no expectation for the result. After doing, there my works is over. So when I do with that sense, the bhakti is bound to come. It's because you have surrendered, you are surrendering in each and every activity to the divine. There's a nice incident in the life of Ramakrishna. When Girish Ghosh, Ramakrishna asked Girish Ghosh that do some spiritual practice. That every day in the morning and in the evening, take the name of the Lord. But Girish was extremely busy, worldly person. He had to look after the theater. He was a uh, he has to compose these uh, dramas, direct the drama. So he was, ex and there were a lot of lawsuits in which he got engaged. So throughout the day, he was busy in something or other. So now he thought, how can I just promise him that I will take the name of the Lord in the morning and the evening? I don't know what type of activities I will be engaged in. I may not be free. So he kept quiet. Ramakrishna understood that he's not willing to just uh, promise me that he will take the name even for five minutes in the morning and evening. He never told that maybe for an hour. Just take the name. And then Ramakrishna told, okay, if it's not possible, at least be before you go to sleep at night, take the name of Lord. Girish was again silent. He was, because it so happened that sometimes he never went to sleep at night because of some uh, he was writing the drama or he was engaged in some lawsuit for which he has to spend the night sleepless. So the question of going to sleep doesn't come. So how to take the name of the Lord? Again, he kept silent. Early in the morning when you wake up, again, he kept silent. At last, Ramakrishna told him, okay, if you just cannot do anything, this in Bengali called Bakalma, that give the entire responsibility to me. Krish was extremely happy. Wow. So I give the entire responsibility to you. So you become my trustee. Just like you know that a trustee who takes the care of a orphan. So you become my trustee. He was very happy that Ramakrishna has taken his entire responsibility. And now one day Ramakrishna asked him, uh, that of some activity uh, for to for some uh, to, to take some responsibility, and Girish told, "Yes, I will do." Ramakrishna immediately retorted back, "How can you say I will do? You have given the entire responsibility to me. You have to say that if you will, it will be done." Now Girish much later told, "This clever Brahmin have." I, I was not willing to take the name of the Lord even once early in the morning and the evening. Now I find that for each and every activity, I have to think of the Lord. That if he wills, I have to just for whatever I do, whatever I, uh, uh, what you say that uh, uh, promise to do, I have to first say that it is the by his will, I will do. If he is willing, then only I can do. So constantly that way he's thinking of the Lord. So now you will find that in Karma Yoga, though one may not be sitting down and meditating, but this, this type of orientation helps them to be thinking of the Lord unceasingly. It's contemplation in the world of action. And through that, one can progress spiritually. And for Vidya Sagar, that is the way out. And that's what he's speaking. The activities that you are engaged in are good. It is very good if you can perform this. 
brought upon them in a selfless spirit, renouncing egotism, giving up the idea that you are the doer. Through such action, one develops love and devotion to God and ultimately realizes him. The more you come to love God, the less you will be inclined to perform action. When the daughter-in-law, Ramakrishna again, the wonderful, that's how nicely sometimes uh, with very examples are so down to earth and it's a very funny examples he's giving. When the daughter-in-law is with child, her mother-in-law gives her less work to do. As time goes by, she is giving she is given less and less work. When the time of delivery nears, she is not allowed to do any work at all, lest it should hurt the child or cause difficulty at the time of birth. So with our spiritual absorption, when the child, when the, when the devotion is born, when the devotion is being nurtured within you, it is growing the other activities is bound to fall off. So now here, another thing is very important. If you could understand, it is a mother-in-law who will be reducing in work. It is not you who are deciding. So again, there is a question of seek not, avoid not. Ours is to grow in devotion. The responsibility will fall off automatically. Many of us say that I have so much devotion, but why God has kept me with all these so-called responsibilities in life? So this question doesn't come. Seek not, avoid not. When really, if the devotion is not just a mere lip service, if it has really developed, know it for certain, the Lord, just like the mother-in-law, will reduce the activities, make the, make the situation favorable, for your spiritual life. So ours is just to try in whatever situation I am to give the best of my time to the spiritual endeavors. A time will come, responsibilities will fall off automatically. I will get the better scope that even in the Bhagavad Gita they say, Sukhinam Srimatam Gehe Yoga Bhrashto Bhijayate. That with all my endeavor in this life, if I am not, if not successful, I will be gravitated to an environment where I will find favorable circumstances. In the family of the yogi, that, that uh, you will find that you are born in a family where all are spiritually inclined, or you get a scope to leave your hearth and home and join the monastery and find the favorable circumstance there. All this happens not by your own will, don't think that anyone just uh, take a resolution to be a monk. You ask any monk, they will say, how I became the monk, I don't know. It's somehow it happens. If anyone plans and becomes a monk, know it for certain, within a few days he will leave. As Sri Ramakrishna jokingly used to say, a very nice story that someone getting disgusted with the family responsibilities, left his hearth and home and went to Kashi. The family never knew where he is. After a few months, in a, a letter came that don't bother about me. I'm quite uh, okay at Kashi. I have uh, managed to get some work. So, so that's where the renunciation ends. At last you will find with all your, uh, this uh, so-called uh, market vairagya, used to say market vairagya. Uh, there's it, it, you, it, the renunciation which is not very genuine. You're feigning that renunciation. At last, it will result. You will find that again you have been entangled in the worldly way of life. So unless there's a real urge for the spiritual life, we won't be gravitated to that atmosphere. Sometimes even within the Ramakrishna order, we sometimes say that when we find that we have to uh, take care of so many responsibilities uh, uh, in our centers, running schools, hospitals, colleges. So the, it, we feel like the, these are all distractions. How nice it would have been if we were born at the time of Ramakrishna and would have got the chance to be one of those brother disciples who were leading an intense spiritual life in the Baranagar Mat, in Alambajar Mat. The question is, 
Am I really, uh, what is the apt for it? If I am apt for it, I would have been there. Otherwise, even if I placed, I'm placed there, know it for certain, within a few days, I will run away from there. That's not so easy. We find that uh, uh, in a monastery, so many people finding the peace, they come with a resolution, I will spend, spend there. And within a short time, they are bound to get uh, bored by it, frustrated by it, because they're not up to it. So that's why here, by reading this line, many think, oh, I am developing spiritually so I can deliberately get rid of the actions. No, it is a mother-in-law. It's not you who himself will be getting rid of the action. It's a mother-in-law who will be reducing your work. That's the, now read the line. It is a God is the mother-in-law. In some other, another place, Ramakrishna gives a nice example. His examples are so funny, but at the same time, it is so apt that a mother-in-law was very strict. She had many daughter-in-laws and she had a serving spoon with which she will serve food to all the daughter-in-law. And the daughter-in-law always felt that food is not sufficient. They used to complain that she gives very less, a bit less food. They always feel hungry. And one day that spoon broke and all the daughter-in-laws were delighted. So that the measurement, that's the thing by which he used to measure the food that is broken. So now most probably they will have freedom. Immediately the mother-in-law told that you may have, you may be just jumping if having, you're having fun and frolic, but know it for certain. Amar hater atke lache. My hand has a measurement. <laughs> so God knows very well that what we want. Uh, that uh, we may think that it has to be deliberately we can give renounce all actions and uh, lead an intense spiritual life. But the mother-in-law has the measurement, proper measurement. He knows when, she, he or she knows when to give what, what type of opportunity to whom. So let us resign to him. Whatever we are doing with, with full, take the maximum advantage of the uh, situation in which I am and then resign to the divine. It is he who will decide and give us better and better scope for our spiritual uh, evolve, uh, uh, unfoldment for our spiritual unfoldment for our spiritual progress. So that's the idea which Sri Ramakrishna is speaking of here. So we will continue these words. That's why we say Ramakrishna's word appears to be simple. We have to die within and really give a what you say contemplative thought on it to find out the real meaning of it. If you forget that it is a mother-in-law who is reducing the work. People will think Ramakrishna is saying that the more you have growing devotion, the more the work reduces. So they will equate, they equate devotion with reduction in work. So they will deliberately try to reduce the work. No, it's not being told there. It's a mother in all who reduces the work. The God will give you the scope, better and better scope, by relieving you from the responsibilities. So have a sense of resignation. Try to develop devotion and have a sense of resignation in time everything will happen. So that's the idea which, which, uh, which Sri Ramakrishna is saying, that nothing happens just as you want. As uh, that's, this Ramakrishna stories are so nice that a child is, every day used to wet the wed. And the child was worried that every day, uh, in spite of that I don't want, I wet the wed, bed. And one day the child says to the mother, please wake me up when I feel that urge. Mother says, I cannot. It will happen automatically. It has its own time. So we have to go on trying. When that real urge will come and the situations will change, we don't know. But let us go on trying that whatever situation permits us. And the mother-in-law will gradually take care of our situation and reduce our responsibilities. So can, we can dive more and more intensely deep into that spiritual uh, involvement. So that's with which uh, we can, we are just concluding our discussion today. We will continue with the remaining portion again in the next class. Thank you all. Namaskars.